like to welcome you to today's discussion, The Ancient Science of Yoga, a fir the first in a three-part series using artworks to explore the scientific aspects of the sister practices of yoga and Ayurveda, after which we'll open the floor to questions related to the presentation. The two subsequent discussions are the Modern Science of Yoga on Saturday, April 12th, and the Ayurvedic Kitchen Pharmacy on Thursday, April 17th. All three programs offer a unique understanding of the art historical and scientific aspects of yoga and Ayurveda. And the final program features a small tasting of Ayurvedic cuisine. So I encourage you to pick up a flyer on the table in the back with more information about the series and to join us here for each. The series is co-presented with the University of California, San Francisco Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, the Asia Society, and the International Association of Yoga Therapists. The museum recently opened Yoga, the Art of Transformation, the world's first major art exhibition about yoga, featuring breathtaking examples of yogic artworks from 25 museums and private collections in Europe, the US, and India, dating from the second to the 20th century. If you haven't already, please visit the galleries after today's program to see the artworks, a number of which you'll glimpse in today's presentation. While working on yoga, the art of transformation, I became curious about the section on medical yoga showcased in the exhibition and its connection to current scientific research on mind-body health. I also wondered where the practice of Ayurveda, referred to as yoga's sister science, fit into the picture. Both traditions are rooted in India and have similar goals for health and wellness, but do the similarities stop there? And what do the artworks in the exhibition tell us about these ancient practices, which are actively utilized and studied today? Well, we're fortunate to have experts from the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, answer these questions and guide us through an exploration of the ancient science of yoga and Ayurveda, along with two, the two Asian art museum curators who worked on the exhibition. It's my great honor to introduce today's presenters, each of whom brings a, brings a world of experience, knowledge, and insight to the discussion. Moderating today's program is Dr. Margaret Chesney, professor in residence and director of the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. In addition to numerous awards and honors, Dr. Chesney oversees programs in integrative medicine research, education, and patient care all of which emphasize the combined use of modern medicine with complementary approaches to establish, um, and established healing practices to promote health, wellness, and healing. She develops partnerships within UCSF and with the local and national community to advance the field of integrative medicine. And we're fortunate Dr. Chesney saw the potential to bring the disciplines of art, or to bridge, rather, the disciplines of art and science and showcase the incredible work done at the Osher Center through this series. The first of our presenters is Dr. Anand Dhruva, a board-certified internist, medical oncologist, and hematologist. He's a clinician and researcher specializing in medical oncology, integrative oncology, Ayurveda, and yoga. In addition to serving as a member of the research and clinical faculty at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, he is an associate professor of medicine on the hematology oncology faculty at UCSF's School of Medicine. The primary focus of Dr. Druva's clinical practice is on integrating Ayurvedic medicine approaches into modern medical care, providing integrative medicine consultations to patients with cancer and those with a wide variety of health concerns, such as arthritis, fibromyalgia, autoimmune conditions, skin conditions, and women's health issues. Dr. Kamar Adamji is the Asian Art Museum's Associate Curator for South Asian Art. Before coming to the Asian Art Museum, Kamar worked in the Islamic Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and taught courses in New York area universities. She earned her doctorate in art history from New York University's Institute of Fine Arts in 2011, where her dissertation work studied visual narrative strategies in an illustrated Indian Sufi romance. Kamar's current research interests revolve around exploring dialogic re relationships in Indian paintings that inform understandings of their form, function, and reception. An immersion in museum practice has also inspired her interest in finding ways to meaningfully translate the past through art objects in terms that make history relevant for our world today. It's fitting for today's talk. And finally, <coughs> Dr. Jeffrey Durham is the Asian Art Museum Assistant Curator for Himalayan Art. 
Before coming to the Asian Art Museum, Jeff was professor, professor of Religious Studies at St. Thomas Aquinas College and the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. He is one of the most engaging speakers I have heard and can beautifully synthesize esoteric concepts on a range of topics from Buddhism and mandalas to stupas and Sanskrit into language that is relatable and clear. Jeff is currently preparing for the opening of Enter the Mandala, Cosmic Centers and Mental Maps of Himalayan Buddhism, which opens in the museum's Tatayuchi Gallery this coming Friday, March 14th. As you can see, this is quite an impressive roster of talent and experience. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and please help me welcome our esteemed speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Allison. And it was really a pleasure for us to be here today and to walk through the exhibition with you a little bit and talk about um, the ancient science of yoga as we do that. We will explore ancient and modern ideas of yoga as a healing art. Now, yoga emerged in India as a means to transcend suffering. This traditional purpose of yoga has clear relevance today. Many people now turn to yoga as a way to alleviate stress and pain, which harkens back to this origins of yoga as a means to alleviate or transcend suffering. And it's done on, what is special about yoga is the idea of the combination and the integration of the physical, the psychological, and the spiritual, the mind, the body, and the spirit. Today, we will discuss this evolution of yoga as a healing art and identify key elements of yoga that are practiced today. And throughout the conversation that we'll have with these experts, we'll discuss images from the exhibition from both the perspective of art history and health. So the, really, the, I will be asking some questions I hope are questions that you may have on your mind. My first question is, what is yoga and where did it come from? So, yoga emerged, as you just uh, mentioned, in ancient India. We have uh, references in uh, the texts uh, such as the Rig Veda and other subsequent sources that uh, start out from about uh, approximately 4000 BC onwards that mention aspects of yoga as a way of uh, transcending human suffering. Suffering being the inherent uh, problem of the human condition. And so what are the different ways in which that, uh, that type of suffering can be alleviated? In the painting here that uh, is in the uh, first gallery of the exhibition, it dates from the 19th century, but uh, very effectively sort of uh, brings visual uh, expression to an abstract concept, which is the relationship between the self and the universe. So the painting is read from uh, left to right, uh, where, where, yes? Sure. Thank you. Okay. So the field on the left, which is just an empty gold space, uh, is the absolute the universal, the luminous, uh, and the Brahman. The Brahman has been described in texts as uh, a luminous entity, the material, which is everywhere and nowhere, material, immaterial, substantive, insubstantive, all at the same time, very beautifully expressed in that gold field. And out of that, out of that universal essence comes uh, emerging consciousness. And here, this emerging consciousness has been represented in the form of a yogi who eventually becomes part of the world. Uh, he's seated in the third panel on a gray field, which is uh, tarnished today, but originally silver, and representing water. So um, just. Hopefully you can go downstairs and take a look at this uh, marvelous gold, shimmering gold. 
So uh, one of the things that has impressed me about this series of artworks, especially the one on the right, is that it highlights one of the most interesting and important aspects of yoga, and that is, well, as the title of this exhibition, or the title of this discussion today goes, yoga is a healing art. Because that image that you see in the right panel is an image of wholeness. Now it's very difficult to understand sometimes how an abstract concept might be imaged forth, but in fact this is an example of exactly that. The gold field is the undifferentiated ground of being. The gentleman that you see there kneeling in the middle is the principle of consciousness, purusha in Sanskrit. And what the, the field underneath is, the, the, the uh, watery field underneath is nature or prakriti. So what you're looking at here is an image of wholeness. It's the undifferentiated ground of being, consciousness and nature synthesized in one image, wholeness. It's interesting that you talk about wholeness um, because uh, if we look at health, and we're really here today to talk about the health or the healing aspects of yoga, the root word of the root of health comes from uh, an old English word or maybe a Germanic word that hull, which means wholeness. So really, what you have here in the word health is an implicit uh, understanding that health is uh, and wholeness are very very much related to each other. And so, um, as it relates to this idea of yoga, again, you have this idea of creating this integration or wholeness, and uh, this is one of the key links between yoga and health. Again, as we think about health, um, it's important to have a broad definition of health and as something that's not just the absence of disease, but really a positive state of being. And that's really, again, uh, brings you this link between yoga and health because yoga, in a way, is really cultivating that positive state of being, uh, which we think of as health or wholeness. Before we go on to the next image, um, I want to just make a brief comment about Ayurveda and yoga because um, Allison very appropriately opened up the conversation uh, drawing uh, this link between Ayurveda and yoga. Ayurveda, as many of you may know, is a traditional system of medicine from the Indian subcontinent that has a several thousand year history very similar to yoga. And these two sciences of yoga and Ayurveda, again, have common origins and a common language. And you might think of it that yoga is really uh, primarily focusing on the health of the spirit and that Ayurveda is focusing on the health of the body and mind. But both systems overlap in, in both of those efforts. And in fact, you can also think of using Ayurveda and yoga together as a therapeutic intervention for what we would call Ayurvedic yoga. And in this kind of an approach, you're, use, you're really using an Ayurvedic diagnosis and an Ayurvedic assessment to guide yoga therapy. So uh, just a few words about that, and we'll come back to this again in our conversation. Can everyone hear me? There. Thank you. Anand mentioned this word, this old English word, how, as the origin for health. And as I listen to this and I hear now about Ayurveda and yoga, I have a curiosity about where did the word yoga come from? All of us know that word as you came in today. It all has meaning for us, but what is the origin of this word, this four-letter word? Okay, when we're talking about the origins of yoga, there are a couple of different ways to approach the question. One way is linguistic, and that's what we'll deal with first. Where does the word yoga come from? Well, there's a Sanskrit root, yuj, Y-U-J, and this is the same root that our English word yoke comes from. So like to yoke horses or oxen to a cart or a chariot. Now, in the yoga context, yoking means the linking of uh, apparent disparates or apparent opposites, and in this case, most especially, those, disparate, the, those apparently disparate things of mind and body. So that's the, the essence of the, the, the derivation of the word yoga. It comes from huge to link stuff up that's apparently opposite. But there's also another way to approach this question of where yoga came from. It can be approached archaeologically as well. And the image that you see right here is uh, an object that has been interpreted as the first visual trace of yoga practice. Now let me emphasize that the script that you see at the top of this seal, which is about 4,500 years old, maybe a little bit less, we don't know for sure. The script has not been deciphered yet. It's our last great 
a human uh, undeciphered script. So we don't know exactly what the interpretation is here, but we can read the imagery. Now notice that this gentleman is seating in, uh, seated in a lotus posture. Or actually, it's a Siddhasana posture, if you're familiar with yoga practice. Um, but in any case, he's seated in a, a cross-legged posture, which does suggest yoga practice. But there's something else as well. Do you see the animal forms around this figure? Well, the Lord of Yoga, the Hindu deity Shiva, is also called the Lord of Animals. So this is part of why this figure has been interpreted as the earliest representation of the Lord of Yoga, Shiva. But there's also a symbolic interpretation here that will become important. Those animals can be interpreted as the uncontrolled animal aspects of one's own nature. And it's by bringing those uncontrolled aspects under control that, uh, that yoga is affected. Now, there's also another image that we have here in this exhibition. That first seal is not in the exhibition, but this one is. And uh, <clears throat> so it's easy to see how the seal could be read in the way that I just described. But in the image that you're looking at right here, which comes from about 2,000 years later, uh, <clears throat> we can make a series of simultaneously philosophical and visual points here. What you're looking at is uh, the Hindu deity Vishnu. This is an avatar, a manifestation of the Hindu deity Vishnu, uh, as Narasimha, or the lion man. Now, take a look at the geometries that are created by his interlocking legs and arms. You'll notice that there is a triangle pointing up and a triangle pointing down. In yogic thought, this is another hieroglyph of the union of opposites. Now, of course, the question then becomes, how do you get these opposites to come together? Well, visually, take a look at that strap around his legs. This is called a yoga parta, or a yoga strap. And what it's designed to do is hold the body steady for long periods of time necessary for concentration. And it's this type of restraint that is able to activate the transformative power that this figure hieroglyphs. Because in fact, this figure is transformed halfway between the animal community and the human community. Very interesting stuff. Interesting, Jeff, that you were talking about the union of opposites. And it makes me think uh, of modern yoga practice. Uh, let's take the pose of downward dog, for example, that I think many of you are familiar with. In that pose, you're really trying to unify opposites. On the one hand, you're trying to lift the back of your body. And on the other hand, you're trying to remain grounded. So it's really, again, that same idea of unifying opposites that you see in this, uh, in this very old sculpture. But you know, one thing that, uh, that um, uh, I'd like to bring back in terms of your question about uh, what is yoga is uh, to bring it down to something very practical. If you all have looked at the yoga catalog for this exhibit, there's a, there's a line in that catalog that I think really captures this, which is that yoga is in essence what yogis do. And I think that really, really cuts to the chase of what yoga is about, because as you'll see through this conversation and also in your tour of the museum, that yoga has such a varied history. And really, in the end, it kind of comes down to what yogis are doing. But uh, to sort of go back to your, your comment about yoking or, or, or joining, if we look at the origins of the word yoga, it, it's seen in the Vedas, which are several thousand years old. And in that context, they talk about joining the horse to the cart. And in those ancient times, that was a very practical yoga, which is combining these two, two very important things. Uh, and that may also have symbolic representation as well. Um, and uh, as we look at um, the idea of joining or combining, that links to modern ideas of health as well. Because in modern yoga practice, you could think about the joining of mind and body and the unification of mind and body. And if you're doing that, if you're unifying mind and body, in essence, you're practicing yoga. So if we're all here in this room with one mind and body in the present moment, we're all right now practicing yoga in some sense. So do we want to go to the next one? So the, the other point that we were discussing is the fact that yoga appears in non-Hindu traditions. Uh, so you have uh, evidence here in the art uh, in Jain and Buddhist traditions of elements of yoga philosophy. And so that just sort of speaks to the idea that this ancient idea of yoga, again, uh, has different manifestations at different points in time in history. If we can go to the next uh, slide. And then I think the last uh, part of the answer to your question is um, that yoga is a spiritual pursuit originally, but 
even the yogis had to take care of their body and mind. And if you look at the yoga path, there is a lot there about prescriptions for taking care of body and mind. And in, in these images, you see some examples of that, um, where um, these aspirants are, or monks are, are caring for the body and mind. Uh, Kamar, do you want to talk about the image? So two types of motifs that keep recurring in uh, paintings, and you will see that in the exhibition, is uh, one scene on the right image where uh, five yogis are bathing in icy cold water in the Himalayan region uh, in a way to physically cleanse their body but also spiritually, uh, ritually bathe before they uh, go to worship at the shrine of the goddess. And on the left uh, is another motif that shows up very often, and that is of uh, yogis practicing in front of a fire. So uh, what you see right, sorry, this is not working, uh, but there you go. Thank you. right here is the fire, uh, some additional twigs to keep that fire burning, and a tiny shovel to rake the embers when he's done, and uh, both the aspect of bathing and fire, or water and fire, are ways also to generate spiritual heat, or tapas, that uh, strengthens the body, but also strengthens the spirit, and uh, creates conditions that enable one to move on to the next step of the practice. And, and, and linking it back to the health of the body, in Ayurvedic medicine, one of the core practices is called Svedana. And Svedana sort of would literally translate to sweating. And uh, so these kinds of treatments are used in Ayurveda to es essentially cleanse the body or detoxify the body through sweat, uh, through inducing sweat. I think, Jeff, you talked about this in our conversations earlier, that sometimes when you have a cold, you like to just sweat it out. And, and that's sort of that same idea of using the principle of heat to, to try to improve the health of the body. And again, you find that here in the, uh, in the yoga tradition as well. So we've been hearing about the spiritual aspects of yoga and also linking those to Ayurveda and to healing and, and even to cleansing the body. So here we're really coming back to that idea that yoga was a way to transcend suffering, a path to enlightenment and spiritual health. But then when I think about yoga today, um, we tend to look at it as a form of exercise with a great deal of attention to breath. So I'm going to try to stump our experts and ask them, how does that relate to the ancient practice? Can they help us yoke those two together? Let's give it a shot and let's use art to do it. What you're looking at here is about a thousand year old image of a figure called a jinnah uh, from the religion of Jainism. Jinnah means victor. Now, the question will immediately be, victor over what? In the present context, it's victory over, some, uh, over the very thing that unites the physical and the spiritual aspects of yoga. The force that this figure is victor, victorious over is something that you're probably familiar with. It's called karma, K-A-R-M-A, -A, karma. Now, karma in its initial context simply means action. It's universal action, universal causality. So a given action is caused by a previous action, which is caused by a previous action, which is caused by a previous action, and so you see the pattern, right? It's an infinite kind of trapping circle. How on earth do you get out of this? Well, the answer has to do, in a certain sense, with heat. The idea is that heat burns off karma. Now, what you're looking at here in this image is not karma itself, but rather its absence. Now, in Jainism, which is the religion that's represented by this figure, karma is actually a physical, it's conceived to be actually a physical substance. And what it does when you engage in action is that karma sticks to you and it makes you asymmetrical. What is this figure if uh, it's nothing else, if totally symmetrical? So what you're looking at here is an absence of a cosmic disease and a physical disease. It's an absence of karma. And it's this karma, simultaneously spiritual and physical, that the yoga path and the Ayurvedic path as well attempt to eliminate from the organism. Mm. 
You know, as I think about your question, uh, one of the questions that occurs to me is why is yoga popular today? And I think it relates to what you said earlier about transcending suffering and how that is a pursuit that really transcends, actually, the boundaries of time, space, and culture. I think that's something that all, it's a human concern. And I think that whether we're going about yoga consciously trying to transcend suffering or on a subconscious level, uh, I think that that might be there. And, and I think that is maybe rooted in, in why yoga is still relevant even today. But I think another part of the answer is linked to meditation practice, which we've been talking about a little bit. And one of the purposes of meditation practice is exactly to transcend suffering. And so um, let's talk a little bit now in the next few slides and in the next few minutes about the Ashtanga Yoga path, which is the eightfold path of yoga. And this relates very, very uh, clearly to the practice of meditation. And um, this comes, or at least this was codified by someone named Patanjali, who um, may have written this around 400 BCE, uh, although probably this goes back older than this. And it describes these eight parts. So the beginning of this path are what are called yamas and niyamas. And you could think of these in a way as do's and don'ts, or uh, if you're from the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Ten Commandments. These are ways of being, ways of living. And in that sense, they're really the foundational practices of yoga. They're really what you have to stand on if you want to make progress in the path of yoga, and that you have to do these basic things. Uh, for example, how can one have spiritual evolution if one is committing violence or if one is being untruthful? These are sort of the prerequisites, if you will, to the path of yoga. And so you may ask, what's the relevance to health of these yamas and niyamas? And, and I would put forward that it's peace of mind. And if you're, if you're strictly practicing these do's or don'ts or Ten Commandments, it cultivates peace of mind. And again, just as these are the prerequisites to yoga practice, they're also in a way the prerequisites to health. Um, again, linking the health of the, the mind with the health of the body. Um, and so again, I think that would put that as a, as a connection between these two things. So the next is in the eightfold path is asana, which is something we're all very familiar with. Uh, Kamar, would you like to talk a little bit about these images relating to asana? And asana are postures, of course, as you many as you many know, as many of you know. And much of our yoga practice today, or conception of yoga, uh, is uh, starts out with uh, a practice-based, a posture-based practice. And uh, one of the things that I learned in the course of my uh, research and studying for this exhibition that surprised me was uh, how late in yoga's history an emphasis on asana actually comes. So while uh, texts from the Patanjali's, the yoga sutras from about the second to fourth century uh, does mention asana and asana remains uh, in discourse, the, the moving postures, the inverted postures that are so familiar today do not really show up in textual sources until maybe the 11th uh, century and onwards as an emphasis. So that's already about 2,500 years after ideas of yoga's have, yoga has been around. And uh, texts from the 13th century, for example, mention uh, in passing that, oh, they're anywhere from eight to 840,000 asanas, but they describe none. Uh, maybe they will touch on two or three of them, but uh, there is no particular description until we get to uh, the manuscript that you, a page from the manuscript that you see up here, which was written in uh, this 1550, and the illustrated version on view here is from uh, 1603. And uh, this is sort of a predecessor to the yoga manuals that we are more familiar with because it tells you this is a headstand. Uh, in order to practice this, you need a level ground, you need to position your body thus, and here's how you move through it, and here is the advantage, uh, the benefit of a pose like this. So um, again, here are more examples uh, from the same manuscript that uh, show other asana practice. 
Well, it's interesting we started with the headstand, but yeah. the uh, asana means the opposite of headstand, really. It means seat. And uh, so these seated postures, in a way, are uh, the true representation of asana, meaning seat. And the original purpose of asana really was to uh, allow one to sit for prolonged periods of time in meditation, right? So you practice these seated postures, you develop that strength that's required in the muscles and the stability of mind and body to sit in meditation. And that's the original purpose of asana. But there's a quote from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, uh, which is a text from the, text from the 15th century, uh, again around the time of these images, which says that uh, asanas give steadiness, health, and lightness to the body. And again, that brings back around this idea of asanas uh, linked to health, um, and that asana practice was really for maintaining the health of the body. In Ayurvedic medicine, for example, there is the concept of stagnation or heaviness leading to disease. And again, if you think of asanas as bringing lightness and health to the body, it's sort of the antidote to this idea of stagnation or heaviness in the body. And then I think the other uh, issue relating to uh, asana as seat uh, is that I find that this can be a great thing even for our modern era. Uh, many of us lead very fast-paced lives, and the idea of just sitting mindfully and quietly is, is actually a health practice. Uh, thank, this is so fascinating to me as I listen to Kumar and Anand and Jeff talk. They're talking about the 15th century and the 16th century. We're looking at a manual that came from 1550. Just to anchor us for a moment, this was all happening um, when Columbus was discovering America. Here across the world, people are being taught how to do a headstand. You know, this is before Jamestown in 1607. So just to sort of anchor anchor us in time. Uh, the other thing I have a question about is that these beautiful paintings that I know are so delicate and so very valuable, how did they come into being? Who would see these? How, you know, how was it that they were painted in these ancient texts? Maybe just a m moment on that, because when you go downstairs, you go about the exhibition, you're going to be seeing these. You wonder, you know, who, who, where was the origin of these? Who paid for them? Who commissioned them? So. This particular uh, text that you're seeing here was a royal commission made by, uh, made by and for, I'm sorry, made for uh, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. Um, a text like this would have been used uh, by, uh, for the personal pleasure and edification of the ruler and at the most would have been seen by a, his immediate circle of uh, courtly elite. So uh, these types of uh, paintings would not really have been for a wider uh, con consumption in a sense. However, people did have access to yogis and people did have access to these teachings and uh, what we realize uh, through the exhibition and uh, other ways is the that the primary way in which people, ordinary as well as uh, noble elite, would access uh, the teachings of yoga were by interaction with teachers. It was a one-on-one, -on -one, a human chain of transmission. And uh, the ways and the, the points of access would be either individuals going to visit gurus uh, in their ashrams or in their monasteries, uh, with bringing up problems uh, that uh, had to do with spiritual matters or just practical everyday life problems. An another point of interaction would be when uh, gurus and yogis would come out of their ashrams or come out of their monasteries and into other settings and places. And the this painting here shows um, a guru up on the left. Uh, as well as other yogis who you see at the, uh, towards the bottom of the painting, attending an event of a religious festival at court. So uh, there were these two ways in which people could in engage and learn from uh, the masters. And that way people would learn about the Eightfold Path. And today is International Women's Day, and I'll just highlight that the guru, I think, or the yogi, uh, one slide back, is actually a uh, female. So a woman is visiting a yogi to get guidance on the Eightfold Path. So let's return to that now. <laughs>
Right. So we were we were talking about the eight parts, and we were on to pranayam practice. So uh, pranayam, I know many of you are also familiar with our yogic breathing practices. And the word prana means life force or breath, and the yama means control or regulation or expansion of breath. And so pranayam is really this control, regulation, expansion of the life force or the breath. And there's a great quote from BKS Iyengar, which speaks to the meaning of pranayama. He says that prana is the breath of life of all beings in the universe. They are born through and live by it, and when they die, their individual breath dissolves into the cosmic breath. Jeff, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about pranayama. This is one of the most fascinating aspects of the Eightfold Path. You know, we spoke a minute ago about yoga uh, <clears throat> helping to cleanse the body, for example, through tapas and fire and such things. But there's another way of cleansing the body and establishing a kind of symmetry and balance within the body. And this is through control of the breath, pranayama. Now, the 19th century image you see here depicts something apparently called nadi shodhana. A nadi is a channel in the body, and shodhana means purification. So it's a purification of the channels in the body, an internal kind of cleansing. Now, you remember that symmetrical jinna that we saw just a moment ago? This practice of establishing symmetry within the uh, breath <clears throat> establishes another kind of symmetry an evenness of breath in the two channels of the left and the right. And what I'd like to do next is show you an image of what happens when this happens. <laughs> How, what happens when you establish symmetry in the left and the right channels? Well, if you take a look at this image, who is a, this is a detail of the Hindu deity uh, Vishnu in his Vishvarupa, or cosmic form. Do you see his right eye? What's in there? That's the sun. Do you see the moon in his left eye? So, the fact that the sun and the moon are there indicate that those two channels have been balanced. The breath has been balanced in the left and right channels. Now, there's something else really interesting about the breath here in this particular painting. Do you see what's coming out of this gentleman, Vishnu Vishvarupa's nose? It's his breath, but there's something special about his breath. It's anthropomorphized. So it looks like human forms, right? So what's the meaning of this? What's the hieroglyphic meaning behind this? It's that your breath not only is alive, but it's sentient too. And so, by manipulating the breath, it's possible to do something even more cool, and that is control the mind, which is what yoga is all about. Excellent. So, you, you know, really that, that speaks to the idea of what I was talking about earlier, which is that pranayama is true mind-body medicine. That it's, you know, really looking at the interaction between mind and body and using it for therapeutic purposes. You showed the slide earlier of Nadi Shodhana, and that's actually one of my favorite yoga practices to work on with my patients, because I find that it has so many applications and so many benefits for people when they can practice that, uh, that breathing practice. Uh, but let, let me leave you with a few, in, in, in talking about pranayama, a few facts about breath that you might find interesting. So uh, the average person breathes about 16 times per minute. And if we were to sort of extrapolate that over the course of an 80-year life, an average 80-year life, that means that each of us breathes about 670 million times in our lifetime. And that's really a striking number when you think about it. Uh, and it speaks to the potential of using breath for health purposes, because 670 million times. Imagine if you can breathe well 670 million times compared to not breathing well that many times and the different consequences of those two ways of being. And uh, I think that because breath is partially under our control, it again becomes a really valuable tool for not only spiritual work but also for uh, physical health as well. So um, completing this eightfold path, we have four more parts. Um, the uh, other two were called pratyahara, which is bringing the senses and mind under control. Dharana, which is holding or grasping to a single point. Dhyana, which is meditation. And then this all culminates in what is called samadhi, which is, again, one-pointed concentration, transcendence, or um, you'd say the final path in spiritual evolution, maybe. And um, so we have, I think, an image. Um, we're going to, Jeff, do you want to talk about this one? OK, so you've already guessed by now that uh, there's a certain obsession here at the museum with uh, visual depictions of what would otherwise be abstract concepts. And what you're looking at here is a visualization of the otherwise abstract concept of concentration, concentration on a single point. Take a look at this gentleman's eyes. 
Do you see how they're slightly crossed? This is a physical sign of concentration on a single point. In fact, on a specific single point. This single point is called a bindu, or a drop, and you see that in the center of this figure's forehead. Now, one of the really interesting things about concentration as well is that once you're able to do this in yogic thought, it opens up a whole vast new world. It opens up an internal world, in fact. And that's what we'd like to talk about next. Are you referring to different ways of looking at the body? I'm referring to different ways of looking at the body, exactly. Okay, okay great. Well, we're going to come to that next. So uh, one last point about this, or two last points. One is that, so you, we've talked about this eightfold path that culminates in uh, samadhi. One of the things that you're doing in this eightfold path is generating what they call traditionally as smruti. And uh, that is essentially what you might think of as memory, remembrance. But another definition of this is present moment awareness. Again, we're coming back to the same theme that we've been talking about. Again, this idea of mindfulness or being in the present moment. And that's part of what we're trying to cultivate with this uh, eightfold ashtanga path of yoga. And then the last point is that we've described these sort of discrete eight parts, but actually you could think of the path as integrated and in that there are elements of all the other parts in any one part. So let's take asana practice, for example. So to do asana practice, you have to incorporate breath. So pranayama is there in asana practice. Similarly, where you have to have control over your senses, you have to have concentration, and you also have to have meditation. So again, even in that one practice, you have elements of the other parts of the Eightfold Path. Again, making this an integrated uh, path of yoga. So we've been talking about this, the path of living, this path of yoga, and focusing a lot on the mind in this, and this idea of concentration. And yet we've talked about mind and body. So we've spent some time with the mind, and now I think I'd like to toss it back to you. And we talked about with the body, there's care of the body, there was cleansing, maybe more of a metaphysical body. So we'll drift now, keeping that yoke together, we'll go from mind back to body. And let's talk about the body a little bit more. So the body is a kind of a paradox in a yoga. On the one hand, it's made up of a physical substance, flesh, blood, and all the messy things that make up the physical, or as uh, some of the yogic texts describe it, the gross body. But that body is also the tool uh, that needs to not only be um, uh, eliminated or at least set aside in order to, for the consciousness uh, and the inner or subtle body to emerge and be stronger. But it's also, it, it's at once the tool as well as the limitation. And it's that, which is what makes and creates that paradox. That's one physical form that we have that uh, is the path uh, to greater consciousness. And uh, under that physical body lies the subtle body, or the metaphysical body. And for that, I turn it back to you. Right, and, and um, in case it's not clear what we mean by subtle body, it's, we're talking about a body that's almost underlying the physical body. It's sort of, if you were thinking of a transparencies, the physical body's on top, and then you have a subtle body that lies underneath. Uh, so you could also think of it as an energetic body or a spiritual body. And uh, we're talking here about um, interacting with both the physical and the spiritual body through a yoga practice. And in that subtle body, that body underlying the physical body, you have these energy centers that we've been talking about, which, is, which are called chakras. And in a way, these chakras are sort of the junction point between these two bodies. In Ayurvedic medicine, we also think about these energy centers, uh, but we think about them anatomically. So as you can see on this diagram, you have the seven chakras labeled. And so if you look at the middle one there, the, in fact, it's the smallest one just under the beads that are there. Uh, this is called the Manipur chakra. And uh, this chakra, like all of the chakras, is associated with a particular element. So there are five elements in Ayurveda, space, air, fire, water, and earth. And so the Manipur chakra is associated with the fire element in the body, which makes sense if you think about what lies underneath that anatomically. Um, here you have all the organs of digestion. And uh, in Ayurveda, for digestion to occur, fire element is required. And so this is how Ayurveda would view the body in terms of these 
centers or regions, and it has medical applications as well. So if a person develops a disease in this region of the body, again, in Ayurveda, you would start to think about imbalances of fire element. Does that person have too much fire element in their system, for example? Are they eating too many spicy foods, for example, leading to problems of fire element in that region? And then the remedy also comes about from that uh, diagnosis, which is that you would treat with the opposite principle. So if there is too much fire element, you bring in coolness into the body. And actually, this is one of the beauties of Ayurveda, is it's very simple in the way it thinks about it. Uh, the treatments may be very complex in the end, but the, the concept is very simple uh, to understand. And again, it links back to this idea of these energy centers in the body. So we're going to go to the next uh, image, which, okay. And one last point I wanted to talk to you about with relates to this subtle body, uh, this energetic body, and the physical body. And this relates to the idea of marma points. And uh, some of you may know about these. These are, again, discrete points on the body, which are junction points between the physical and the subtle bodies. And in Ayurvedic medicine, these are used for therapeutic purposes. Um, but yoga also uses these points uh, for the same purpose. So you see here in this image here, uh, this headstand. So again, the headstand, why on the head? You know, you could do a shoulder stand, you could do another way of inverting the body. There's a very specific reason, and it's because there's a marma point that lies on the top of the head. And so if you put yourself in a headstand position, you're putting pressure on that point in the body, and that has then therapeutic effects. Or for a yogi, it has the effect of steadying the mind and emotions, which is what applying pressure to this point would achieve. Additionally, what you see in this image is his feet are uh, positioned behind his body, and, and they're lying essentially right on the muladhara chakra, uh, which is at the base of the spine. And again, this is also one of these therapeutic points on the body. So you see in this image this idea of yoga asana or yoga postures as a way to um, uh, basically do pressure point therapy on the body. And I think that's also seen in this Narasimha image that we looked at earlier. Again, if you look at this initially, you might say, well, okay, the, the legs and the arms, he's just relaxing in that pose. And, uh, and, maybe, and it is certainly relaxing, but the position of his arms and legs is very specific. And where his arms meet his knees is, again, a pressure point on his arm and a pressure point on his knee. And those pressure points also have similar purposes of steadying the mind, steadying the emotions, uh, and creating that uh, that state of mind that's required for meditation practice. So again, um, many of these things are very precise and very well thought out as to where you would position your hands and your arms and your legs. And it can be used for spiritual purposes or again, also for therapeutic purposes for health also. So we're going to wrap up our part of the talk here, and then we'll have, I think, plenty of time for questions, and hopefully our conversation here has uh, stimulated some uh, questions for you all. Um, but I want to leave you with just a few final points before we move to the question section, and I think uh, uh, Kamar and Jeff also have some final points. And, and that is, what are the characteristics of therapeutic yoga? And uh, one is uh, a yogic understanding of the mind, body, and soul. And we've, we've talked about that here in, in this conversation. That includes the gross and the subtle bodies, the idea of body channels or nadis, the idea of chakras or marma points, uh, as, again, having spiritual and uh, therapeutic purposes. Um, again, we talked about this shared uh, theoretical framework of Ayurveda and yoga, which again uh, highlights the healing effects of yoga. And then lastly, um, we talked about this idea of smruti, or memory, or mindfulness. And again, highlighting that as maybe a key ingredient of how yoga has therapeutic effects. Uh, Jeff? Okay, memory of what? How about memory of what and who you are? So what you're looking at here is a full image of Vishnu Vishvarupa, that uh, fellow that we looked at a moment ago with the prana the anthropomorphized prana coming out of his nose. Uh, <clears throat> you can tell when you take a look at this figure that, in fact, this isn't just any uh, figure. This figure, Vishnu Vishvarupa, has the whole cosmos in his body. And it's this world that opens up 
to a person when this capacity to establish samadhi or one-pointed concentration heals the organism. What's realized? That the world is inside you as well as you are inside the world. To quote an old 80s song, you are the world. And I know that that sounds a little cheesy at first, but the experiential aspect of this is anything but. It's liberation from that disease we talked about at the very beginning of this talk, karma. And it's the clear vision that comes from the elimination of that disease. And looking at all of this material uh, visually, as well as uh, some of the points that we've been talking about, it is uh, what comes to me is how uh, yoga continues to be relevant for us today. Because it is about the individual, but the individual as more than just an ego-centered self. Uh, in order to be a, to fulfill one's uh, a fulfilled life, uh, sorry, to live a fulfilled life, uh, you need to be centered and uh, stable within yourself, but also to be a part of the bigger whole, which is uh, here the cosmos or the community. Uh, and the two go hand in hand and uh, making it coming back to a, a whole circle. One cannot f be fulfilled without the other. So, thank you. What I find so fascinating about hearing about yoga and this idea that we have the gross or the physical body, then the subtle body that's the metaphysical body, and the mind, and how these talk to one another and are linked at the chakras throughout the body, it harkens back to the idea of that we are integrated beings. And it underscores the importance of something that we do at the Osher Center at UCSF. We think of each one of you as an, a whole person with mind, body, and spirit, so that your full health and wellness needs to capture and bring those together. As done any time that you're thinking about healing, we have to be looking at, we're not just looking at the physical body, but we're also looking at the more the subtle body, the spirit in all of that. Um, you've been hearing, there's a lot of language here and so forth, but, and so what I'd like to do is open, um, open up for some questions. I know some of you may not be uh, staying th throughout all the questions. I really encourage you to do so. But I want to say that this group will be together again, and I hope to invite all of you. And that will be that we'll be meeting again on the 12th, Saturday afternoon, to talk more about the modern science of yoga, but linking it again to the exhibition and hearing from how this transcends centuries of time. And then there'll be an evening program that use it, looks at yoga and thinks about Ayurveda and the, the actually talks about the kitchen and what we eat and how the kitchen can be a pharmacy to tap into some of the things that Dr. Dhruva has just said. So what I'd like to do is, I think, open it to questions. We have considerable time. And we have a question right here. Hi, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm working with a, a client, uh, a gentleman from India, who suffers from possession. He has a demon in his belly. I'm very curious what your thoughts are about demons. <laughs> um, hmm. That's an interesting question. I can't say that I've thought a lot about demons. Um, I would be interested to know about his complaints. And um, again, what I find in my practice and what I love about doing Ayurveda and Western medicine is that there's many ways, there are many ways of looking at a problem. And what one person calls a demon, another person may, may frame it in a different way. So I'd like to hear more about what, what he frames as a demon. And I think that, that that's how I would uh, look at that. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Sorry. Up here. This is going to take a long time. I wanted to ask about the difference between the marma points and the chakras, because I think they were described, both of them, as junction points between the physical and the subtle body. Mm -hmm. um, well, the chakras you might think of as sort of the like Grand Central Station. Uh, all the trains are coming through the chakras. And you might think of the marma points as maybe a small station along the line. Uh, so they're both, again, these junction points, but the chakras maybe are more potent in some way uh, than marma point, individual marma points might be. I think she has a follow-up. She wants to follow up. Sorry? 
And just as a, as a follow-up, just how do you use them therapeutically? Yeah, so in Ayurveda, um, uh, there's a treatment called an abhyanga, which is essentially a massage. And in this massage, uh, they treat marma points as they're doing the massage. And additionally, what's done at Marma Points is that you use uh, herbalized oils or herbs and essentially uh, rub them in those Marma Points. And the choice of Marma Points and the choice of oils or the choice of herbs are, again, based on the diagnosis that you would have. Um, so it's, again, very customized or very tailored to a particular situation. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thinking of the chicken and the egg, uh, which came first, thinking of uh, mindfulness meditation, it seems like, uh, which, which would you think came first, the meditation and the postures to support it, or the postures to support meditation, or, or is there such a way to define which came first? Do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> historically speaking, almost certainly the meditative practices came first. Almost certainly the, the mindfulness practices came first, and the way we know this is through Buddhist texts, which are our earliest sources uh, for this sort of thing. And a smarana is part of the Buddhist path of smriti, memory. One of the other things that um, a lot of people have asked me about is, oh, I'm going through the yoga exhibition, and um, in the first two rooms, all I see are people who are sitting or standing. There is uh, really no representation of uh, moving postures or inverted postures or any of that. Uh, sculpture after sculpture, painting after painting, from the very early examples as well, just show seated and standing postures, which comes back to that point of the mindfulness and the meditation aspect comes before uh, the rest. I would like to know the significance or symbolic multiple arms that are always seen in Hindu deities and goddesses. What does it signify? The multiple powers of the deity that's represented. So for example, that wheel that you see in Vishnu Vishvarupa's upper right arm is one of his weapons, and this signifies his power over various things. So these are iconographic components, oh, thank you. Yeah, these are iconographic components or visual components that, um, that reveal philosophical concepts. Does this mean that we, we can develop these powers uh, mm -hmm. and strength? In, and in fact, if you read the Yoga Sutras, for example, the third chapter is all about the development of precisely these sorts of powers, supernatural powers called Siddhis. And I'd encourage you to go down into the galleries and take a look at some of the, the representations of these Siddhis or supernatural powers as well. You'll see a whole bunch of them. I think she wants to. I'd like to ask a question that's related to that. We often see when people are meditating different hand gestures and the thumb pressed against figure eight. fingers. Can you tell us? And we saw that in, I think, some of the figures here. And perhaps you could tell us about that. I do. Well, so one significance, you know, I talked earlier about the five elements, which is air, space, fire, water, and earth. And uh, ancient people, this is how they defined or how they understood the universe, that everything in the universe is made up of these five elements, either on a literal or a metaphorical or a symbolic level. And the body is also made up of five elements, and each of the elements has a lot of meaning, uh, both for health and for spiritual purposes. So the hand gestures are, are mudras, and so there are, is meaning in, in that in and of itself. But also the five elements are represented on uh, five fingers, and so you have air, space, fire, water, and earth. Uh, each of the fingers on the hand is a manifestation or uh, sort of an embodiment of one of the five elements. So if I hold my um, hand like this, I'm essentially uh, connecting air and space element or sort of uh, creating strength with the air and space element. And among the five elements, these are the two elements that are most ethereal, the most transcendent, the most associated with spiritual, spiritual work. And so by doing this, in a sense, you're um, helping to facilitate your, your spiritual practice. What, one more question. Is Ayurveda accepted by American medical science? And are there practitioners in the United States more? I'm going to answer that question after Jeff has a comment. but. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, you sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's an interesting question because uh, in India, of course, Ayurveda is an established system of medicine and there are hundreds of thousands of practitioners of Ayurveda who go through a six or eight year training, uh, very similar to medical training in the United States. But in the United States, um, it falls in California under the Health Freedom Act, which is a, a law that we've passed in California, which essentially says that as long as you don't diagnose or treat a disease using Western medicine, you're allowed to counsel people about health uh, in a very broad sense. And uh, that's where Ayurveda falls, at least in the state of California and in several other states in the United States as well. In the introduction, I'll just highlight that Dr. Dhruva actually is, uh, practices this Ayurvedic form of medicine at the Osher Center. Mm -hmm. So he is an Ayurvedic physician as well as an integrative oncologist. Thanks. And if, if we could come back just very briefly to the very good question about what's going on with the hand gestures. Okay, so in yoga thought, the physical and the philosophical, the medical and the philosophical, are not that distinct from each other. In fact, they interpenetrate. So this gesture, when deployed in a meditative situation, for example, in a meditative posture like this, this indicates the union of the Brahman, the undifferentiated absolute, with your individual self. So not only is this medical, it's also philosophical. And it's the inseparability of these different components that might initially seem like they're total opposites, that's really a keynote of the tradition. And, and also Purusha and, and Prakriti, right? Thing, which exactly. you talked about earlier. Exactly. Purusha, which is this uh, uh, expansive state of consciousness, or this is consciousness, and Prakriti, which is this individual uh, identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So th this lecture was titled The Science of Yoga, but it seems to me that you've gone native. How much of how much of yoga is scientific and how much of it is unnecessary pain? <laughs> So it's interesting. I mean, I think you know, science, of course, is a knowledge system, and so we are talking here about a knowledge system of yoga and, and its applications to health. So in that sense, uh, this is a science of yoga. But I think the real answer to your question comes in the second talk in the series, uh, which will be in April, where we're going to talk about uh, what we usually think of as science, which is research studies and uh, as sort of the evidence base for yoga. And we're going to be discussing that in much greater detail in the second talk. Um, and the idea here is to kind of lay the foundation of the, the concepts and then, and then uh, go more deeply into the science later. But, you know, I, I think we can, we have a little bit of time, so maybe we could give them a couple teasers. <laughs> uh, uh, there is a great deal of science uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health in terms of uh, actual grants to, as well as foundations are supporting research on uh, yoga for various problems like yoga for low back pain. Um, maybe I'll mention uh, the work that we've done at the Osher Center. We've used, um, Dr. Druva and I have worked on a project to help women who've had breast cancer who develop, if they've had lymph glands removed, they can develop a lot of fluid in their arms. Do you want to talk just a little bit about that and how we used yoga for that? Absolutely. So in that particular study, we're using a more dynamic kind of yoga, which is more flowing and active postures, with the idea that, again, if you have poor flow in a particular extremity, that those kinds of postures might be uh, uh, the remedy for that situation. And then um, I would say also that um I'm glad you've asked the question because, as you've probably seen from this conversation, that yoga has a very varied history, and um, I don't think that we should treat it as a so-called sacred cow where we're just saying yoga is good for everything. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think that we should do research on it, and I think we should study it for its modern applications. Um, something like lymphedema is a great example. We don't have that described in ancient times necessarily, so how do we use yoga for that purpose? I think that is a very appropriate research question. Or in my field, I, I, I do work with cancer patients, and chemotherapy is a very modern type of treatment. So how does yoga help a patient who's undergoing chemotherapy? Again, that is the subject of a research study, and that's the purpose of modern science, I think, is to, is to try to help answer some of those questions. There's also, in learning more about yoga and what the effects of yoga on the body, it's educating us that there may be applications of yoga, like the lymphedema, that others had not thought of. 
So for example, I will, uh, Ananda and I thought, should we mention this? But there, as people age, particularly get into their 60s and 70s, there's sometimes issues around incontinence. Yes. And in um, Western tradition, we have very little that we offer people for that. We say we don't really talk much about it. And yet in the body, there are muscles. It's called the pelvic floor. That's sort of the, your, your underbelly, if you will, um, between your legs. There's all muscles to kind of keep everything in place. And with yoga, there are ways using the postures to, re we'll use the word recruit, or recruit those muscles so that there's much more that we can offer people um, when using yoga to learn to strengthen muscles that most of us don't think much about. And so we have a study at um, UCSF where we've actually shown that that was more effective than the more standard approaches. And we just heard from the National Institutes of Health that we put in a grant for that, and it looks like it will be funded. So the National Institutes of Health was interested enough in saying, let's invest some of your tax dollars to see if this really would provide an answer uh, for people that teaching them how to recruit those muscles. So that's a very modern application. I know there are lots of other questions, but I didn't want, there's so much more we'll be talking about in the next talk. Can I just make one last comment about that? And Never then... ask scientists about science. <laughs> That's right, we'll keep talking. Uh, well, so this idea of using a yoga uh, approach for incontinence or strengthening the pelvic floor, um, the, one of the practices that's used is called Udhyana Bandha, which is essentially, again, uh, contracting the muscles of the pelvic floor, but linking it to breath. So, for example, as I exhale, I'm contracting the muscles and then I'm exhaling. And then I'm, as, I'm, as I'm inhaling, I'm relaxing the muscles of the pelvic floor. So the standard exercise would be Kegeling, which is where you're just contracting, extending, uh, con contracting, expanding. In this yoga practice, you're linking the contraction and the expansion with breath. And again, this is where we're talking about the science of yoga in this talk, because we talked here about how many of the efforts in yoga are linking breath with postures, linking breath with a particular activity, uh, mind and body, again. And so that's the scientific basis, in a way, of yoga, which you can then test in a clinical trial, for example. So they're, they're all kind of connected. You know, you have to have the theory then to actually ask the right research question. Hello. In the exhibit, the term renun renouncers is used to describe Hindu aesthetics and Siddhartha. Is there a distinction to the term renunciates? Uh, actually, no. It's a direct translation of the same word. So. Yes. Um, I had a question. You answered some of the questions that I had regarding um, Ayurvedic medicine and cancer, and I was just wondering, beyond symptomatic uh, relief with the yoga, um, if there's other things, like how, for example, would you treat somebody that has stage four cancer? So it's pretty terminal. Yeah, that's a good, very good question. And um, I would say that uh, if that person wants to control their cancer, they should pursue Western medicine. Um, I don't recommend um, alternative treatments for the treatment of cancer. And I have a reasoning behind it, and I could explain it to you in more detail if you wanted to talk afterwards. Um, and it's not that I'm saying that alternative treatments or other kinds of treatments for cancer are not effective. I'm just saying that the most reliable method that we have today, based on research, based on evidence, is, is Western medicine. And uh, the way I look at it is, is uh, to use an integrative approach, which is, again, where you're bringing in these other traditions, like yoga, like Ayurveda, like Chinese medicine, to complete the treatment for that patient. And uh, I know that in the modern paradigm, those get diminished as secondary, right? They're just supportive. They're just on the side. But actually, again, if you think about what we've discussed today, this integration of mind and body, uh, even if a treatment is for the mind, it's not necessarily secondary. Mind and body are connected. And so if you're able to stabilize the mind, steady the mind, that actually is a great help for a person, even independent of what's happening with cancer, for example. So at um, many medical centers, and certainly at UCSF and with the Osher Center, what we do is we, we bring out those mindful aspects in with meditation and support um, and counseling and help people realize, you know, come to a, a sense of well-being throughout um, treatment for stage four cancer 
and yeah, as a part of our lives. And we really think that that's a very important thing that's integral in the treatment, as opposed to, as, as Anand was saying, we integrate those in because we're always working with a person as a mind, a body, and the spiritual aspect. And one of the purposes of yoga and Ayurveda is to cultivate strength. Um, in Ayurveda, we call it bala, meaning strength or shakti. And uh, when you cultivate strength, that translates to so many other health benefits. Maybe you don't get colds as often in the winter or the flu. Uh, you have essentially a resistance to disease. And uh, I find that to be a very profoundly important thing, actually, just in and of itself. Hi. Um, you talk about earth, air, fire, water, and space, and I'm wondering the role that time has. Is it that we're out, there's, time is outside of all of this, or it's more fluid, or why is that element not addressed at all in what you've been talking about? Temporality actually is not one of the physical elements. It's, um, and it's, it is understood differently in different traditions. So, for example, in Buddhism, uh, the first thing that pops into my mind, temporality is understood as the entire matrix of the cosmos that, that awareness is trapped within. And so the goal is to get yourself out of temporality. So if you take a look at the different traditions, and this includes different yoga traditions within the Hindu tradition, you'll have different answers to that question, which again highlights the extreme diversity and experiment, experimental nature of the tradition, whether we're talking about its philosophical aspects or its medical aspects. So I was hearing about chakras and the other... Um, marma. Marma. Mm -hmm. um, and I take there are many marma points. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if there's any correlate, any neuroanatomical correlates mm. to those points and if there's any relationship to Chinese medicine. Yeah, great question. Um, Thank and you. I, I just yeah. want to make a comment that's yeah, just please. been so fascinating to me to study some of the research about how meditation uh, changes the brain, mm -hmm. actually changes synaptic connections between various parts of the brain. And so I'm thinking about how chakras might and mm. marmas might yeah. play into that as well. And even actually changes the anatomy of the brain. For example, we have uh, studies showing that is it the cingulate gyrus in the brain actually uh, is larger or is, is thicker in meditators compared to non-meditators. So not only the physiology of the brain, but also the anatomy of the brain can be affected by these practices. Yeah. Um, but coming back to your question about uh, marma points and their correlates, their anatomic correlates and also their, their connection to Chinese medicine. Um, many of the marma points are either identical or almost identical to uh, acupoints in Chinese medicine. Uh, so there's a very, very strong correlation between the two. And, and at the Osher Center, uh, we have th uh, three Chinese medicine practitioners, and we're often sitting and discussing you know, the, these different uh, connections between these two systems. And, and then the second part, what are the anatomic correlates to marma points? So most of this research comes from the study of acupoints, which again I told you are very similar to marma points. So there's a woman uh, researcher at the um, Harvard uh, Osher Center uh, named Halan Longovin, and if you want to look her up, you'll see some of her studies. And what she has done is looked at the subcutaneous connective tissue network, or matrix, which is essentially this uh, body-wide matrix which lies under the skin. And what she's found that at these acupoints or marma points, there is a density uh, of connective tissue, essentially. So when you're putting a needle, for example, in an acupoint, you're really hitting a dense area of connective tissue, for example, and that then sort of interfaces with the entire connective tissue matrix, which then interfaces with the immune system, which also then interfaces with the nervous system. So in a way, you're sort of like putting something into the point that then has these cascading effects uh, throughout the body. Um, and, and this is just still early work, but, uh, but it's really fascinating to sort of see these correlations between these points. Um, not, nece not necessarily nerves, but there are some marma and acupoints where there are actually arteries, nerves, and veins coming together underneath that point. So there is that also, yes. What we know in acupuncture and in we, we know this from acupuncture, and we haven't done the studies with marma points, but when 
uh, something disturbs that point, there is almost instantaneous recognition in the brain. Now that we can do brain scans, you can just imagine that we, we, it was very simple then to say, well, let's put in a, an acupuncture needle and see what happens. And it is almost instantaneous, the response, the brain recognizes something. But what um, Helene Langevin that Alain, uh, Anand was talking about is that you can, this connective tissue, if you think about gluing things together, you know how when you, glue, you start to glue something and you want to move it and you peel it back a little and there's all that stickiness the kind of fibers that, and then you move and you try to glue it back down, like Elmer's glue. That's what this, this fiber network that is throughout our entire body, and it was something that was not studied much before we had electron microscopes. It just wasn't this fascia that holds us together, but it, the evidence is that there is neural, path, there are pathways, actually, it's, we don't have a word for it, but they talk to one another. There's evidence that this this network is very, very much engaged, and you can even see pictures as the, as a needle is placed into the skin, how the fibers actually grip the acupuncture needle mm -hmm. and are like assessing it. And this is all going on in the body. And Anand is right that there is impact, that the, these fibers seem to have a, a connection either through the nervous system or not, we don't know, to triggering um, immune responses and so forth. This is cutting edge science. The other thing you have at these acupoints, again, you, you're right, once we get us going, you can't stop us. So please tell us if you want us to stop. But uh, you also have uh, fibroblasts, uh, which is a very specialized cell in the body. Uh, their fibroblasts are pr present in the connective tissue, but fibroblasts are very multipotent cells. They have a lot of different functions. And they also function in the immune system, and they also, again, interface with the nervous system. So again, you have these concentration of these very, very uh, uh, multipotent, very useful cells in the body, again, a concentration at these acupoints. So that's also very interesting. It is, though, very interesting to know that these marma points are at these critical junctures in the body. Uh, there's also research, we won't go into it today, but on meditation and how meditation, and we've studied the effects of meditation because we're so interested in trying to understand how these ancient activities that were at, you know, before Columbus discovered America, those activities actually have physiological impact on our systems, on our immune systems, and so forth. You know, how does it get under the skin and make us healthier? And we have time for more questions. Yes. Um, boy, that is just crazy interesting. It's like relating the snot that was like little people. That was crazy. <laughs> but to like grab, you know, your fibers grabbing an acupuncture needle. So I am coming back to the next lecture. Um, but uh, you said you got an NIH grant. Um, is there a lot of grant money to support this kind of research, or is there anything else that people can do to advance knowledge about yoga and Ayurveda within Western medicine? Do you want to? Well, of course, scientists think there's never quite enough grant uh, support, but there are foundations that. Um, have donated funds, you know, philanthropists are donating funds, uh, the Osher Center, and you'll see an Osher Gallery here in the building uh, are really due to one of the benefactors here in San Francisco. So we always benefit from people, just as the um, Asian Art Museum does, from people who uh, have means to try to support this kind of work that we do. Um, but the NIH, you know, money, of course, for everything these days is a little tighter than it used to be. Other questions? Oh my gosh, lots. We'll go yeah, back there and then I've got, we have a couple more. Um, can you talk okay. a little bit about um, plant medicine and the relationship that in your practice if you use that as opposed to pharmaceuticals? Mm, yeah, that's, I like that question too. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the reasons I went into integrative medicine and Ayurvedic medicine is so that I wouldn't have to use my prescription pad anymore. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, and it's not that I don't uh, think medicines are useful, they are, pharmaceuticals can be useful, but for me, my first line is always diet and herbs. And if I can address a problem with diet and herbs, then I don't have to prescribe the medication. And the reason being is that, okay, medications, what are the problems with them? One is that they can be costly. Uh, and then secondly, they almost all of them will have side effects. 
And if I can avoid that, again, avoid the cost, avoid the side effects with something that uh, uh, doesn't have those problems, I would rather do that. And so I do use mostly diet and herbs uh, as my therapies. And then if someone comes back and tells me, well, it doesn't, doesn't work, then I'm happy to pull out my prescription pad and write them a prescription for whatever they need. Um, but that's how I approach most things. Uh, is there a relationship between the marma points and the lymphatic system? Mm -hmm. You know, it sort of relates to my answer to the earlier question that there are some marma points where there is an intersection of, in the body we think of these four vessels, you know, arteries, nerves, uh, uh, veins, and lymphatics. And um, yes, in fact, in many of these junction points, there is an intersection of these four, four structures in the body, yes. Mm -hmm. So. I'm here, and um, I, I'm in, thank you very much. This has been absolutely fascinating. And I'm interested in the relationship between the two sides of the panel. Um, in a way, my question is, do, 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 does science and do doctors gain any knowledge or inspiration <laughs> from the visual tradition that the artistic side has said? And artists, are you learning something more about reading your visual tradition by listening to the doctor side? Can I quickly answer and then you can answer too? I, I'm laughing because uh, we've been meeting for the last six weeks or so, like, you know, pretty often. And every week we meet, we say, wow, this is so great and I wish we could do this all the time and we're learning so much from each other. So the short answer is yes, it's been an amazing process just to have this dialogue, uh, not only today, but in working up to this talk. From the art historian's perspective, especially on a topic like uh, yoga, um, to me, uh, there is a fundamental understanding that whatever I see in an artwork is there because somebody has thought carefully about it. There is very little that is accidental because uh, of a number of reasons which include preciousness of resources and materials. So um, it, whatever we see is not accident. Even if I do not fully understand every detail, there is a point to it. And in the course of these conversations here, I'm looking at these headstand pictures, uh, uh, paintings, or the Narasimha poses with uh, a, a very different perspective now. And uh, it reinforces to me the point that, yes, there is a point to what the visual depictions are all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also goes to, um, again, reinforce the idea that there are many holistic systems out there. Uh, art and life are connected. And uh, they're not just random, they're not just uh, living in two entirely separate realms because artists are living in the world themselves. And while they have creative imagination, they are still inspired from the world that surrounds them, an internal as well as an external world. And we see that in, like we started out and ended with two of uh, my favorite artworks from this exhibition, uh, which among the fact that they are beautiful, what really attracts me is how do you give visual form to abstract concepts and visual form in a way that is somewhat believable, that is relatable, that you can map on in many different layers. And uh, here is one wonderful example. I won't take up time right now. Come to a gallery talk, and you won't be able to get me uh, quiet about this one. But um, the, the short answer to this important question is yes. <laughs> and the, the, the best way to understand this from my perspective is that image of Narasimha, the half lion, half human avatar of Vishnu. Now, when I take a look at this, I look at it in terms of iconography, philosophy, and symbolism. So I see that double triangle. I see the yoga parta or the yoga strap. So I, I see this as a historian as well. But these are different. Art history and, and being a historian is one way of construing how reality is constructed. Science is another way of construing how reality is constructed. And so when I take a look at this and consider the marma points, for example, in relation to this image, what I see is the intersection of a couple of different reality systems that may well be synergistic with each other. So instead of them being 
opposite. And they're actually complementary and more than complementary synergistic. Mm -hmm. So solutions that come from the scientific sphere inform my understanding of the art. Symbolism that comes from the artistic sphere, I believe, is going to feed back into scientific research as well. I would hope so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will say this has been one of the most pleasurable experiences, and actually being here with you today is also part of that. It was amazing for me to learn to look more closely. So when I look at the exhibition, and I know this has changed me, uh, I will now look for that coals in front of the person, and what were those twigs and the little shovel that would dis, you know, take the coals apart. What was interesting is, as we went through these figures each time, you know, looking to pick the artwork, we would see different things, and sometimes they would see things that were late to science, sometimes we would ask them questions. So I, I think nothing happens by chance, so I just feel very indebted to Allison who introduced us to making this possible and for all of you to be here because without you we wouldn't be sitting up here together and it's changed our lives. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say the answer is a resounding yes. Um, I think we're, is there any last question? Yes, we have one more question then we'll do a quick close. Um, oh, we have two. So let's go to the gentleman back there. We have two more questions and we'll have a final comment. I'm, I'm having a great deal of difficulty sitting here and not speaking up because I think here in the United States, uh, or particularly throughout the West, we have a bias uh, believing that the metaphysical sciences and the empirical sciences are somehow unrelated. Uh, to put people's minds at rest, I would like to share my life experience. Uh, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in 1974. Uh, many, many years later, I found out that I also had lupus erythematosus. Uh, after repairing the damage that was done to my body from those two diseases, I joined the party here in San Francisco and quickly contracted AIDS, hepatitis C, and also had cancer, the cancer related to, uh, uh, to AIDS, and that is uh, Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, and uh, lately, I have been told that I have uh, a condition called, um, uh, I, I, I think it, it's COPD, it's uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So over the years, I have managed quite a number of conditions. And I have to say that the centerpiece of my care has been my own study of the ancient sciences, the ancient arts of healing. And I have incorporated them not thinking in terms of it is either this or it is that, but instead I have incorporated it as a unified whole in my own health care. It has been extremely difficult because the Osher Center was not around in 1973 when my life journey began. But there is a definite application for all of these sciences uh, in our culture, and I think uh, I really have to hand it to the Osher Center and to everybody else here for making this this concept uh, visible uh, to the West. I think it's high time that we got there. Thank you for letting me make that statement. I have a, one very simple question and one maybe one maybe not so simple question. First of all, you refer to the NIH grants, hundreds of them by, I guess, hundreds of, oh, I'm sorry, hundreds of uh, grants have been awarded. How can a person in general public get hold of the reports that were generated? I've got it, actually. Yeah, so he's, he's asking, so, you have a second part, okay. And my, the second part of my question is, I have heard all you folks refer to very ancient theories, Panch Bhautik universe, the five elements, mm -hmm. uh, subtle body, all and other things. And I'm, I'm sort of a student of history of science as opposed to. And you know, throughout our experience with science, theories that are proven to be wrong are discarded or are outmoded are discarded. What's the use of talking of five element universe in a, in a day and age when we know there are 92 elements that make up the universe? <laughs> I mean, 
why carry on with it? We no longer talk about flat Earth. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about the Earth-centered universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why carry on? Okay, that's a good question. I'm very ready to answer, answer that question. And it has to do with different perspectives, and I think I alluded to this earlier. Five elements, and uh, I think there's actually 118 elements on the periodic table, they're not uh, in conflict with each other because it's a different conception of el the word element. Uh, when you think of the five elements, it's earth, fire, space, and water. So there can be overlap between these two different concepts, and I don't see them as opposing each other. And then secondarily, as a clinician, as somebody working with people trying to deal with their health, the more perspectives I have on a particular health condition, the more I have to offer that person and the better understanding I have of that health condition. So let's take something like fibromyalgia. Uh, patients will come in and say that they have aches in their muscles and joints. And in Western medicine, when they see that kind of condition, it's kind of a, I don't know what to do with this. You know, it doesn't make any sense within the Western medicine paradigm. Uh, there's no good explanation for that condition. But if I take Ayurveda and look at that condition of fibromyalgia, for example, it's a very well-described disease. It's in the ancient texts. There is a uh, well-described way that it happens. So there's a pathogenesis for it. And then there's a great treatment plan that comes from it. So because I have these two, at least two different perspectives, it really expands the options as opposed to being a conflict or a problem. You can do a develop a mass. You can develop a system of mathematics to explain the universe from an Earth-centric point of view. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, we know it is wrong, and we don't refer to it anymore. Mm -hmm. Five-element theory is. I think it's, these are different perspectives that might be best discussed um, and afterwards. afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Drew would be. Uh, NIH question, you want to? He was asking where he can find the reports of studies oh, funded oh, by NIH. Um, if you're interested, come and see me and I can give you their websites. Everything that we now do is made available to the public through um, a public websites. So all the results are now made available and newly all the data will also be made available to the public, which is all very recent and great. So I just want to um, thank you all for coming. Please pick up a flyer at the back that has the other programs and enjoy the exhibition. Thank you so, so very much.